David and Rashmi, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. So for the, we have an exciting end of our end of session. And uh, for our invited speaker, we have the co-chair um, of the conference, along with Devinder, Iltafat Hamzavi, who's been a leader in Vitiligo internationally. He has made significant impact in terms of introducing melanocyte transfer techniques to physicians in the United States, in terms of his development of tools to analyze vitiligo, such as the VASI score, in terms of his um, work on use of phototherapy in vitiligo, in terms of his founding uh, and co-founding of the Global Vitiligo Foundation and remains a mentor to many of us um, around the world in the, in the subspecialty area. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Iltafat Hamzavi to give his talk on phototherapy for vitiligo. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you actually for being one of our um, rising stars. Uh, a couple of years ago, you weren't in the vitiligo space and then bang, you showed up with all this ruxolinin of stuff. So thank you for being here. And thanks for, uh, coach, um, uh, for chairing the session. Um, I'm hoping I can get this opened up. So let's take a look here. So we're gonna talk about optimizing the management of the vitiligo patient using phototherapy. And I wanted to um, indicate my disclosures, relevant support from industry. Um, in many ways, it's a hard line sometimes to walk with industry, but I think all of us know without industry, we wouldn't have this opportunity to organize this meeting. But I also wanna share with you the fact that our relationships across the world have allowed industry to develop. And given the last talk, I think we also can help industry deploy the resources to produce products that people want to use, but also have a sense of socioeconomic justice. Um, if we only develop these products for people who can afford them, we won't really serve the broader population. And it's so nice to hear this fact that we have a moral compass in what we're doing. We're also talking about how many people are affected by vitiligo. And I want to thank these companies specifically for really leading the way, Insight, Pfizer, Vita, Clinivell, um, Pfizer and Abby, I'm also consulting with them and also the ITN network that's coming up, as well as companies are looking at pigmentation, but industry has a role to play. I wanna thank them for that. I also wanna disclose my interest. But this is my home state of Michigan in the United States. We hosted the VIS a few years ago. Um, this is the river walk uh, behind which the actual meeting was held. And I would welcome you to come to our state any time of the year. Um, when it's snowing, it's gorgeous. When it's sunny, it's gorgeous. It's just a wonderful uh, state and a wonderful home to many of us. Uh, the Global Vitiligo Foundation helped to co-sponsor this. So I wanted to start off with pathogenesis and talk about how phototherapy can be used in the context of vitiligo. And many of us are already using phototherapy. And many of the individuals on in our scientific committee, which we wanted to thank, have presented really nice presentations. And they also selected different talks to explain this. So I'm not gonna go, this, go through this with too much detail, but in essence, you have an oxidative event that Dr. Marco Picard and so many others have discussed before that seems to initiate the immune event. Um, along with an immunopathogenesis, possibly related to the microbiome of the gut and the skin, as discussed by uh, Dr. Marie and Dr. Passeron's group. And then also uh, talking about the melanocyte reservoir. We haven't covered that in much detail. And Dr. Manga at the last meeting talked about this in quite a bit detail. But all those elements interface to be a factor in phototherapy. And phototherapy within the immunopathogenesis, and these are a couple of articles that have come up in literature, affects all those areas. So specifically, you have a downregulation of T cells using apoptotic mechanisms. You have the downregulation of inflammatory cytokines, upregulation of interleukin-10, which regulates T cells. But do, does phototherapy affect the memory T cells that we've heard about so much in this meeting? And that's a question, but given clinically what we see, it's not likely unless we're talking about early cases. But there is an immune pathogenesis behind this. On top of that, you also have the melanocyte reservoir, which is one of the few treatments we talked about. Outside of melanocyte transplantation, which Dr. Devinder Prasad did an excellent presentation on, it's very unlikely that you'll be able to really promote melanocyte migration without having some form of stimulation. Phototherapy is one of them. And as David's work suggests, uh, you really need phototherapy even with the JAK inhibitors. And so here's that 
famous schematic that came out of the JAD paper that John Harris and Julian Seneschal have really helped us uh, develop. And again, we're all drops in the process, but they really have brought this uh, uh, area to the forefront. And Dr. Pandia, the educator that he is, really explained this very well. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but realize that the JAKSTAT pathway is part of this. Um, and many years ago, we started working with vitiligo with my colleague, uh, Dr. Harvey Louie, and we talked about the Sorry here. Um, we talked about the efficacy of phototherapy, and the VASI was actually developed looking at phototherapy within the context of um, efficacy using the VASI. And this is that original paper um, that shows the degree of depigmentation and pigmentation. And we were able to document that this was a group that tended to respond. We were able to develop some initial work using the VASI to measure the degree of improvement. And in essence, we had about a 42% improvement in the overall VASI score over six months using phototherapy. And that was one of the first papers to kind of look at categorizing this in a parametric measure. And then uh, we broke down my body sites. As many of you mentioned, phototherapy doesn't work in uh, many other body sites. I'm, I'm sorry, it does not work very well on the feet or the hands, but does very well for the face. And this is Harvey um, a couple years ago at the um, BIS meeting in Detroit. Uh, one of my friends and mentors, and uh, one of the things I would encourage you in the vitiligo community to remember is science is also about community, and uh, the friendships that you will develop are lifelong. The Vinda Prasad and I have been friends for many years, but it's really a joy to see the whole field develop. Now, one of our other colleagues, um, the factory of innovation, Dr. Jungmin Bai, has done a lot of work showing that when you look at Puva and narrow band, as many of us know, Puva was the big kid in the block. It was the dominant Phototherapy used for many years comes from traditional Indian medicine as well as traditional Egyptian medicine. Then Dr. Al Mufti in the 40s really developed it. Dr. Madhu Patak um, at Harvard um, also really emphasized with Dr. Thomas Fitzpatrick. But when you look at all of the meta analysis, narrow band phototherapy is more effective than PUVA. So I'm going to focus most of the conversation on PUVA, uh, I'm sorry, on narrow band. And it takes about 12 months to get that rate of response that you're looking for. And the face and the neck in the meta-analysis have a much greater degree of improvement than the other body locations. Now, you can definitely get a response, but when you get to the hands and the feet in the meta-analysis, you don't have the same degree of improvement. So the meta-analysis kind of backs up what the original report suggested, that hands and feet, especially the tips of the fingers, don't respond, but the rest of the body um, does better, and the head, face, and neck have the best response. Now, Rolo Cabrera, who helped us with uh, a lot of the Vilago Working Group, the, the precursor of the Global Vilago Foundation, was able to show that there's rapid responders and there's non-responders. And when you have a patient who has that initial response in the first 24 sessions, you tend to have a very good response. So if you look at that group, if you see somebody repigmenting very early in that first three to six months, you're probably gonna have a pretty good response. But then in so many people, phototherapy doesn't work. Well, how do you decide well, there are these slow, slow responders who can have pigmentation that can take up to 72 weeks to develop. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, 72 sessions to develop. However, when you look at those overall groups, they still don't approach the same levels of response as the rapid responders. And so he broke this group up into these areas. It's an excellent paper. I encourage you to review it um, in the Acta Dermatology Journal, but also it matches up with what Dr. Um, Ewan Joe just presented you have different subgroups who respond and don't respond. And as the armamentarium or different options will develop, phototherapy has a role to play, but this is also a way, something that we see clinically. There are different biomarkers that will allow us to categorize it, but you have your very rapid responders. They tend to respond early and they tend to have a better response, but you can't assess if somebody's not responding until you get to around 48 to 72 treatments. And this is something that I think Amit Pandya did a very good job over the past 20 years. And, uh, not that far in age, but he's definitely one of my teachers and got me into vitiligo in some ways. And he was very careful about explaining that treatments in vitiligo take time. And our studies are designed that way, phototherapy is the same way. So you start phototherapy. And this is one of the papers that I worked with. And Samia Asmat uh, headed up the committee at the uh, Global Vitiligo, I'm sorry, the VWG, the GVF, um, in creating this phototherapy group. And uh, we had Tasneem Muhammad, who kind of led a lot of the efforts, who's actually now a vitiligo investigator, Mohamed Al-Jamal, uh, John Harris, Giovanni Leone, uh, Dr. Cabrera, Dr. Lim, Amit Pandia, and Samia Dr. Asma, who's also on this meeting today and chaired a few sessions and has mentored many of the people, 
led this effort. And this led to a lot of our recommendations. Tasneem Muhammad put this picture together and it's one of those nice pictures that shows you phototherapy can be very frustrating. And she did a lot of this work um, and Dr. Madigan, one of our residents did a lot of work comparing the different articles and came up with review the literature. And then we brought the um, different parts of the world together to look at this area. And again, that comes back to our sense of community here at the VIS. We can't do vitiligo by ourselves. And every country, every department, every city has something to contribute. And sometimes we feel we don't have a voice, but please, at the VIS, you all have a voice. You have to produce quality work, but we all can learn from each other. And this is a great example of a global collaboration. And we looked at all the different recommendations. We looked at 12 questions proposed by Dr. Madigan. We did a multiple conference calls. And here are all the different protocols that were present at the time uh, when this study was done. And ultimately, the surveys, consensus questions, at the Photomedicine Society, we had final recommendations, which I'll you know, review for you. And these were summarized by uh, Dr. Rahil Zubair in a paper that we wrote recently, but this is from that 2017 um, JAD paper, which basically says that optimal administration is two to three times a week. The dosing protocol is starting up at 200 millijoules, increasing by 10 to 20%. And then it has the maximum acceptable dose of the face and the body. It talks about the maximum number of exposure from a safety perspective. And it also talks about assessing the treatment response at after 18 to 36 treatments. Again, if you really wanna to get to those slow responders, you have to get to, four, um, to 72, but even those slow responders, if you look at the Cabrera paper, don't achieve the same degree of repigmentation as the fast responders. So we kind of gave some general guidelines of how many exposures you needed to take to eventually have a response, but compare that to psoriasis, where it takes around 18 treatments to clear many of the people who initially respond to phototherapy. Then we talked about the dose adjustment based on erythema that Dr. Amit Pandia has done such a great job of explaining how to assess, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And it talked about how to adjust the doses be, um, between treatment sessions. It also talked about how to recalibrate your devices, decrease doses by 10 to 20%. And again, all of you, please continue to calibrate your devices in your phototherapy units. You cannot treat vitiligo safely without doing that. And then we had the Bi Innovation Machine. He's done lots of work assessing safety. Skin cancer does not seem to be a higher risk. And also he found this really nice study or and, and this, this nice meta-analysis looking at, I'm sorry, not meta analysis, um, a, big, a big data analysis, which looks at cardiovascular and cerebrovascular events are decreased following long-term narrow band exposure. Now there's lots of concomitant variables, but does phototherapy have a systemic effect? But the question at the, at the outset is, is it safe? It seems to be safe based on meta-analyses. Now, what else can you use? Um, you can use topical therapies. You can, um, um, you can also look at tapering narrow band, but as we've learned earlier, there's only a subgroup in which you can taper phototherapy. Once those memory T cells are formed, it is very unlikely you can stop phototherapy, but there is a subgroup, especially in early treatment, where you treat with phototherapy, they repigment, and you can hold on to them. And then it talks about the follow-up. In our lighter skin populations, we do want to continue to follow for skin cancer risk. And then we talked about eyelid lesions, which we felt you could treat um, using adhesive tape if necessary. And then I also want to comment on many people throughout the world. Uh, um, Imran Majid, who was uh, moderating yesterday, did a nice study with Tupralimus. But Thierry Pasteron in 2004 looked at the adjuvant treatment with Tupralimus and phototherapy. And again, these are wonderful groups that have done so much work. And the dose adjustments we talked about, but I especially want to talk about that pink carnation. And if you're from Texas, you always think that you're bigger than the rest of the United States. And we always have a little you know, jo uh, uh, jovial resentment with Texas, just like every other country has their Texas. And uh, this is a carnation out of Texas, but that's the type of erythema you want in between sessions. So we often talk to our patients saying, this is the type of erythema that's gonna be optimal for you. If you achieve that level of erythema between sessions, you're probably getting the right dose, but you don't want a bright red pigment um, um, effect on your skin. You want a light pink carnation effect just like this, uh, this rose. And again, um, you want a graded degree of erythema. If you have bright red symptomatic erythema, you really need to back down on your treatment. As far as adjuvant therapy, uh, this is a summary of the different references and I'll list the references, but in, in general oral steroids, which we'll talk about extensively, <clears throat> very effective. Topical steroids in combination can also be effective. Um, topical calcineurin inhibitors, multiple studies initially uh, some of the work suggested that it was equivocal, but most subsequent studies have showed that topical calcineurin inhibitors in combination with phototherapy is more effective. And then you have the upcoming advance of alpha-melanotide JAK inhibitors, which has been covered earlier, and I'll cover it in a little bit of detail in the next few minutes. In addition, I want to emphasize the work of Dr. Picardo, 
um, as well as uh, Dr. Westerhoff's groups from many years ago, um, as well as the continuing of work where antioxidants such as polypodium leukotomus in conjunction with narrowband phototherapy seem to improve the overall results. And here's some references you can use. Now, systemic treatments, when should you consider that? And I want to emphasize to my colleague from India, thank you for showing us the way here. When I started hearing about this, I heard about this first in India. It was such a pleasure to see this country offer so many great events and so many of the academic institutions talk about this. Uh, going back to about Dr. Roth in 2008, Imran Maja talked about in children, Dr. Prasad and Singh really kind of brought it home with these studies. And so many of us have benefited from that. And then Dr. Pandia's group has also done work showing that you can get this result. This patient had failed PRUVA, failed narrowband phototherapy, failed narrowband phototherapy in conjunction with topical steroids, failed narrowband phototherapy in conjunction with um, with uh, uh, macrolimus and tacrolimus. But then when she was given systemic pulse dose steroids had a significant degree of repigmentation. It shows you that in vitiligo in many subsets, there's a systemic disease component to it. You add the phototherapy for the melanocyte migration, you add the oral steroids, you tend to get a better result. Phototherapy and surgery, an excellent analysis was done recently. As of right now, the quality of studies does not suggest that you can do phototherapy with surgery. However, I know that this case reports a small case series suggesting that you can. I'm sure I would like to hear from my other colleagues throughout the world about their thoughts on this, but excellent work that Dr. Wolkestoffer. I wanna give a lot of thanks to our colleagues from the Netherlands who have led, they were the center for the first rounds of discussions of narrowband phototherapy for vitiligo. They've been centers along with Dr. Van Giel for the work on surgery. And then these meta-analyses that they do, that's how science advances. We do these little droplets, we figure out what's all working, and we have these wonderful meta-analyses. I want to acknowledge in this portion of my talk, all these wonderful people who have worked together to kind of develop these standards for phototherapy. This is really difficult work. Um, and here's some references that you can look at for some of the papers that I discussed earlier, some of the concepts I've discussed. I also wanted to get into the future. Uh, Dr. Grimes, Dr. Lim, myself and others did the athlonotide studies showing a lot of promise that alpha MSH with phototherapy may be helpful. Oral JAK inhibitors have a role to play, obviously. They're gonna be a major source of innovation, but how do you interface phototherapy with JAK inhibitors? David Rosemary and many others are working on these studies, looking at extension phototherapy to see if that improves results. We also have systemic plant derivatives. I don't want to do this talk without recognizing that out of China, out of India, out of Europe, out of the United States, alternative medicine is using plant-based derivatives in conjunction with phototherapy. And these are treatments that are based on thousands of years of work. And we do have a basic science empiric-based system, but there's also another system that also has shown benefit. And the JAK inhibitors, we've covered that already, um, but there's not some nice papers um, presented from this group today showing that JAK inhibitors in conjunction with phototherapy work. But it points to the fact that if you don't target the, the melanocyte, if you do not improve melanocyte migration, you will not get the optimal results. And there's gonna be a role for phototherapy going forward regardless. Now, next, and the last phase of my talk is talking about why did we pick narrowband? Why did we pick PUVA? PUVA had a traditional history and Dr. Fitzpatrick and Dr. Mufti kind of developed that. Narrowband was developed for phototherapy um, for vitiligo and ultimately resulted in the creation of that study by Dr. Westerhoff and Dr. Lim also um, showed that effect was, was, uh, was effective. Um, but are, these are only choices. And then Dr. Indy McCauley in our department, along with Dr. Pastron, have shown that visible light can cause pigmentation in different skin types. And so when you have visible light um, effects, you can exacerbate melasma, you can have um, shorter wavelengths, which seem to induce the immune pigment darkening. And then Dr. Pastron um, did some excellent work showing that it was a shorter wavelengths of visible light, which can induce pigmentation. And then Dr. Coley and our group have shown that visible light and long wavelength UVA in combination can also in induce pigmentation to a greater degree than UVA la lamps alone. And so these are some of the studies showing that, again, visible light can be effective in pigmentation in normal skin types. And then when you apply this to vitiligo, it suggests that you can also have a greater degree of pigmentation. And we've done some initial work showing that in combination with visible light and UVA, you have a greater degree of pigmentation. With narrow band, you have 7% decrease in deep pigmentation in this particular image using digital imaging. And then with combination treatments, um, you get a 36% decrease in deep pigmentation. So it's not to say that we had all these wavelengths figured out, but what we can say is that phototherapy is 
something that we can develop specifically for vitiligo, we don't have to adapt what psoriasis used. We can develop our own systems with global collaboration. So again, these are some of the summary slides. You can take a look at some of the, rev, um, the references here. Um, I wanted to thank uh, all of the teams that, that have come through our department for so many years. I'm so proud of the ones who are actually working with LIGO. Dr. Indermi Coley has done so much work in this area. Angie Miller, who organized all of our research. Many of you know her. Jenny Creaser, our vitiligo research nurse. Gail Torres visiting us from the Philippines. Tasneem Muhammad is a faculty member at Henry Ford working in vitiligo. I wanted to thank Dr. Sanjeev Molikar, who is instrumental in building up our vitiligo surgery unit. He's ill at this time, but cannot be here. Um, I want to thank Richard Huggins, also a faculty member, who leads our global efforts in organizing our patient support groups as a physician, as a researcher, and as a humanitarian. And this is our research team at Henry Ford Hospital. I want to thank Nick Coleus, who was instrumental in developing the concept of visible light. He's no longer with us. His work goes on with us. And Alexis and uh, Lyons and uh, all the wonderful fellows who have come on board. I want to thank my fellow um, co-chair, Dr. Dimit Prasad, the GVF board who have worked so hard in all this work. That was us in Detroit. There's like a thousand people or more who are watching these videos right now, so it's a lot bigger. I hope to see all of you in Bangalore doing the same picture but with a bigger audience virtually as well as in person. But at the end of the day, these are the people we work for, this vitiligo community that actually is so active in developing our domains of research, our patient community, um, who also will be present with us in Bangalore, but are also present with us today virtually. Thank you so much to everybody for the chance to hear, and thank you so much, so much for the VIS and the GBF. So thank you so much, Iltifat. That was a wonderful lecture, and I'd like to really thank Dr. Davinder Prasad as well as yourself for inviting me to co-chair this session. And as usual, this is a great session. My pigment might help with that hyperpigmentation. But I think Dr. Pastor and others will add to that body of knowledge. Uh, thank you for that answer. There's one more question that we could take up. Questions from Dr. Imran Majid. How efficacious is narrowband UVB for stabilizing with LIGO, in your opinion? And how stable is the repigmentation achieved with UVB? So I think it depends on the baseline characteristics of the patient. If they're unstable before, you're probably not going to achieve stability with narrowband phototherapy alone. If uh, they were stable um, before, but at a, a slow rate of stability, because again, we know now that non-segmental vitiligo for the most part is always unstable, but on a spectrum of stability, I think in those patients, you might be able to achieve it. The place where I think you can achieve significant stability is early disease. Okay. So do we have the time for more or should we move on you know, to the next session? Mm -hmm. So I think I can hand it over to David You know now. Thanks. Maybe we can ask one um, one more question. Um, this one is from Imran Maji. How, effi how efficacious is narrowband UVB at stabilizing vitiligo in your yeah, opinion? Yeah, I think he's done that. There is one from Dr. Leon, and that is, what is your uh, opinion regarding non-conventional phototherapy protocols such as stop-and-go protocol, when there's a stop-and phototherapy for a while and then resume, which has been described in the paper by Jung Ming Bei. So this is his question. Right, I think that paper suggested that there is a different options. And I think we have to kind of continue to do research in this area. And there's so many nuances to this work. I can't answer that um, from a meta-analysis or broader perspective, but we have used it. And I don't think I can answer whether or not it works in our patient population, but that area of research is really invigorating. and it's something we have to pursue. A lot of promise with that. Okay, so thank you so much for thank you. being there for the session and great, you know, seeing all of you meeting all friends, you know, after a long time. So over to you, David.